Good afternoon and welcome to the IPM Hour Southern Edition. We're really glad that you're here for this February, I guess we would call it episode of the IPM Hour Southern Edition. I am Kayla Watson, the Communication Director at the Southern IPM Center. And that is one of four regional IPM centers supported by USDA NIFA. And we have been charged to coordinate IPM across the region, which we love to do. And we started this IPM Hour Southern Edition series so we could actually virtually hold the required PD meetings in crop protection and pest management so they could present their work. But now we actually get to uh, allow others to present their work in IPM across the Southern region as well. So um, it's been really fun and uh, we're really looking forward to today. So um, our first speaker today um, if you have questions for them, what you can do, you can type your questions in the Q&A box or use the raise hand feature, both located on your Zoom control panel, and we will hold those questions until the end of the presentation. So um, just let you know, and I believe you can do those anonymously, so if you don't want anybody to know that it's actually you asking the question, you can, um, you can do that anonymously. So our first speaker today is Glenn Studebaker. He's an Extension Entomologist IPM Coordinator at the University of Arkansas um, Cooperative Extension Service. And he's going to be talking to us today about Arkansas Extension EIP. So uh, let's welcome Glenn. We're glad that you're here and thanks for coming to the IPM Hour. Thank you. I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, as you said, I am Glenn Studebaker, Extension Entomologist with the University of Arkansas System. Uh, they always want to make sure we put that system in there. That's how we're supposed to introduce ourselves now <laughs> with the Division of Agriculture and the Cooperative Extension Service. I've been Extension Entomologist with, uh, with the University of Arkansas for 32 years now. The time flies when you're having fun. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about our uh, Extension IPM program that we have in Arkansas. I have took this over about uh, six or seven years ago. And uh, there we go. All right. Let's get started here. As I said, uh, I am the coordinator for the extension implementation program with, uh, with IPM. And get my, there we go. Uh, this is the uh, award number for this uh, go around with the uh, uh, EIP program through the USDA NEFA. And our program, we have uh, four primary focus areas uh, that includes row crop IPM, uh, animal IPM, uh, specialty crops, and uh, this, this go around, we've had some IPM for pollinator protection in there as well. And we have a secondary focus area, the uh, support for the plant disease diagnostic lab. Uh, which has been very important for our state. Uh, we do have a team. Uh, as, as I said, I am the coordinator and the primary PI on this on this program. I am an extension entomologist, and I, I primarily work in row crop IPM and most of the row crops grown in, in Arkansas. And we have several co-PIs that head up different sections of the uh, rest of the of the program. Uh, Travis Fasky is our extension plant pathologist, who works in row crops as well. Kelly Lofton is our extension entomologist that works with uh, heads up the animal IPM program with cattle and poultry and, and hogs primarily. Uh, Aaron Cato is fairly new uh, graduate from the University of Arkansas. Uh, he's our extension horticulture IPM specialist. And he, uh, this past year, took over the uh, specialty crops uh, portion of our, of our program. And uh, he's doing a great job uh, with that right now. I expect that to to grow in the, in the coming years. Uh, John Zavishlak is our extension beekeeping instructor and he's, he heads up the pollinator IPM and Sherry Smith is our uh, director of the uh, plant disease diagnostic lab. We also have other support. This, uh, we really, this is a team effort uh, in Arkansas. We have other, other uh, faculty that uh, really contribute to the uh, IPM program and uh, we serve on basically a committee to give guidance and direction to, uh, to our program in each of their respective areas. Uh, we have several more entomologists, Dr. Gus Lorenz, who's uh, getting close to retirement, but he's, he's been around with the extension entomology for a long time. He actually headed up this program uh, with the coordinating the IPM program uh, prior to me taking over. 
and we have Nick Bateman and Ben Thrash, who also work in row crops as entomologists. Uh, a couple more plant pathologists, Terry Spurlock, he works primarily in row crops, and uh, Dr. Yeshi Wamishi. She works primarily in rice at the, at the Rice Research and Extension Center in Stuttgart. Uh, both of them are also extension plant pathologists. And then our weed scientists, we have two of those that, uh, that contribute, Tom Barber and Tommy Butts. We also have some input from uh, our agronomists in our, in our primary crops, uh, Jason Kelly in feed grains, Jeremy Ross in soybeans, Jared Hardkey in, in rice, and, and Bill Robertson in cotton. And we have two uh, county agent mentors. These are actually a, county, a couple of county agents who were who uh, ready to retire. And uh, uh, we convinced them to uh, take on a position as basically instructor and mentors to our, uh, some of our newer county agents. And they've helped tremendously and give a lot of, a lot of input and guidance on our, our program as far as how we work with the, with the county agents. And that's Hank Cheney and Andy Van Gilder. I'm going to go through the different uh, primary areas of our of our program. Arkansas, uh, the row crop IPM program, uh, we have what we call a mini grants, a county mini grants program. Uh, because we in Arkansas still have county ag agents in every county, all 75 counties have at least one agent in them. Uh, we we provide funding to these agents to focus on on the, conducting their IPM programs with the with the clientele in their county. Uh, by doing it this way, it allows us to you know tailor the programs to the specific needs of the local clientele in each county because uh, one side of the state has different needs than another side. So that uh, does it really help us to fine tune, tune the program on the, on the local level. Uh, there are some requirements. They do have to have an IPM aspect or focus in their, in their proposal. And in this uh, last uh, cycle, we've, uh, we've distributed 93 mini grants that have been funded uh, through, through the program with the uh, row crop IPM. Uh, the crops that are involved in, in Arkansas is cotton, soybean, corn, grain, sorghum, rice, and uh, our peanut production has, has really increased over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, seen a big, big ups with tick in that. Uh, to be in the program with the mini grass program, the agents uh, have to uh, submit a proposal in one or more of these crops in their, in their county. They don't just have to uh, you know, focus on one if they want to have uh, several, several crops in their, pro in their uh, proposal they can and they have to include some sort, sort of a demonstration and pest monitoring and, and outreach and then they have to put together a budget as well and then uh, we uh, I require reports due at the end of each season uh, to the uh, coordinator which would be myself. Now uh, we found out with with the county agents it really helps if we as, a, as the committee puts together and comes up with a focus areas uh, for them to really look at and uh, uh, give kind of preference to as far as what we'd like them to work on. Uh, in insects, you know, we've we've had uh, uh, automatic applications as one of the programs that we've looked at. Uh, the one and done programs really to to give agents the uh, uh, opportunity to to show that uh, automatic op applications aren't necessarily good for IPM. Uh, we also have sugarcane aphid management, and we started this. Uh, Kudzu bug survey was, and management was was important because kudzu bug had came into the state and uh, uh, the last last couple of years it's it's still here but it's not really a problem so it's kind of been dropped as a as a focus area in our IPM programs they can still do that if they want but it's not a primary focus area uh, but some of these other insects as well you know dicti stem borer rice stink bug uh, southwestern corn borer monitoring management has been a, a big aspect of our program and, and the red banded stink bug has been a problem as well a uh, newer problem and in, in the southern part of the state and those those agents often focus on that and also some insecticide termination cover crops and another new aspect our uh, rice production has has changed in arkansas and we're seeing more and more row rice production uh, with and with that uh, we've seen an increase in uh, a problem from bill bugs in rice and uh, really trying to focus on just how big the problem is. And, and this is an aspect that uh, rice growing counties uh, uh, can focus on. Uh, we don't just focus on insects. Uh, we also have uh, disease management. Again, uh, you'll notice uh, automatic applications, one and done programs. A lot of these are kind of tailored to uh, insects and, and diseases. So uh, that's also part of the uh, disease uh, focus. Host plant resistance. NSTAR is a, uh, a uh, 
uh, fertility management program that really helps to manage uh, rice diseases. So, uh, so a lot of them do that and, and disease surveys and some of the various crops as well. Uh, weed science. Weeds have become a huge problem and uh, particularly herbicide resistance uh, in Arkansas. So resistant weed management is a, is a big focus and resistance monitoring. Uh, we uh, A lot of agents will We'll collect weed seeds to uh, send in for uh, uh, to determine if the weeds are resistant and what herbicides they are resistant to, which has a tremendous help to some of our growers. Also, uh, uh, herbicide te application technology is is another newer one that we've uh, really focused on, as well as cover crops and and flag the technology, which is to flag the different uh, herbicide technologies that are in the field. All right, I'm going to go over just some of the highlights of some of our uh, our, our programs. Um, and I'm going to talk about, uh, as, as one of the showcases, uh, the Southwestern Corn Borer Monitoring Program. Uh, we, we do have uh, agents deploy traps in corn growing counties. Uh, these are all serviced by county agents. We also have some, some farmers and consultants that, that want to participate and, and uh, work with the, the agents to run a few more traps in some of those areas. And then uh, we track emergence and population peaks, and, and those numbers are reported weekly on our, on our row crops blog. Uh, one of the reasons this this program has has gotten so important is we've seen a fairly large increase in conventional corn grown in the state, uh, which is in response to a premium being paid by a uh, non-GMO uh, poultry producer uh, uh, that uh, pays a premium to these growers if they grow a non-GMO corn. And as a consequence, southwestern corn borer has become a, a bigger problem uh, in those areas. So this is, has been a, a pretty good program for our, our state. Uh, what they found out, all the yellow counties are where there is at least a little bit of, of uh, uh, conventional corn. A lot of our conventional corn has grown in the more of the northeast delta and central delta of the state. Uh, but uh, not every county has had southwestern corn borers. Uh, these two red counties here, Monroe and Woodruff County, are counties over the last three or four years that really have been a hot spot for southwestern corn borer. And really the only place where uh, growers have, have needed to spray. One of the reasons this program has been so beneficial is uh, prior to monitoring, uh, many growers, if they grew conventional corn, just made an automatic application because southwestern corn borers are very difficult to scout for. Uh, so many of them just made a prophylactic application that uh, as we uh, began to trap, uh, found out was completely unnecessary. Uh, except for these these two areas. However, because the acreage has grown, we have seen uh, this uh, last year, uh, southwestern corn borer uh, populations have begun to spread. And so uh, this program is going to become more important as, as, as we move on, especially if conventional corn continues to expand in our state. So as you can see, we have had uh, five counties last year. Again, kind of seems to be spreading out from that central area around that uh, where those other two counties were as, as hot spots. So, be interesting to see what happens happens next year. As I said, we uh, report these on our our uh, row crops blog, which is part of our website. Uh, we I will put out an alert. County agents will will uh, also send out newsletters and and text messages to their clientele in those particular areas. Uh, but we do post this, and and uh, we found a lot of clientele and growers really really look for this uh, during this time of year when, when we see uh, southwestern corn borers uh, blow up. Uh, one of the other successful programs we've had is the one and done program in soybeans. Uh, that's one of our crops where there seems to be a lot of what we call one and done where they make automatic preventative applications at a certain growth stage to uh, control diseases and insects, uh, regardless of whether there's any, any pests or not. Uh, a lot of these growers, uh, uh, are expecting higher yields from this, but uh, not necessarily paying attention to the bottom line. As far as uh, uh, the objectives to this particular program, you know, we have agents to uh, initiate demonstrations, comparing those automatic prophylactic applications to uh, uh, applications made based on our thresholds, and then determine the profitability of the two programs, looking at cost, yield, increase, and profitability. Uh, uh, which, and these results have been shared at, at grower meetings and, and other venues. Uh, large block trials on key growers are what we really try to get them to focus on, uh, the leadership in the county, and then uh, the work with the consultants that are in those particular areas. And this is just one of the demonstrations from one of our, our larger producing counties, Mississippi County. 
where they uh, did the uh, treat, treating at threshold and then the uh, insecticide alone, fungicide and insecticide plus fungicide. And you see that uh, for the most part, uh, they were able to demonstrate that there was really uh, not a profit from making the applications at uh, automatically, whether it be insecticide uh, and fungicide together or alone. So uh, it's been very, very, very beneficial as far as uh, demonstrating to growers the, that uh, this may not be the best option for them to save money. All right, uh, one of the big things with our, like I said, with our resistant weed uh, survey and our, our, our weed science section of the IPM program, uh, a lot of the Delta counties, as you can see in the yellow here, participated in a survey where they collected weeds from, from specific species and sent them in for testing to see if uh, if they were resistant to particular classes of herbicides. Again, this has also been very beneficial for our growers. This is just a sheet from several years ago, just to give you an example uh, of what the kind of report the, the agent and the and the grower get, uh, basically showing whether their uh, uh, the uh, weeds are resistant to what classes or, or type of herbicides. So it helps the growers as far as making. Uh, choices as far as what herbicides to use in the future in their particular area and, uh, to know what kind of uh, resistance problems are popping up. Uh, they have detected some form of resistance in all counties and it does appear to be increasing. So uh, growers uh, do, do benefit from uh, the information making proper herbicide selection. Uh, kind of summarize some of our row crop IPM results. And over the you know, last three years, they've, uh, we've had 455 IPM demonstrations in, in the counties. Uh, 45 agents were trained in IPM. And that is another really uh, aspect of our program that, that uh, we've seen to be quite effective is this, this program also is very productive as far as being able to train agents uh, because they are having to put out demonstrations. We work with them. It really does help. Uh, help with, uh, especially we've had a, quite a few new agents over the last three or four years that have started uh, young agents just out of college. And so this has been very beneficial to them and they've indicated that as far as helping them as, as far as training is on, on IPM in, in the field. Uh, those agents have logged over 16,000 field visits. Uh, we have a program, we use a, a farm dog program where the agents can actually log their, their visits and it does help us to keep track of them and uh, kind of an eye opener as to how many visits they're actually making uh, to the field. Uh, we had uh, 485 row crop scouts trained in IPM. Uh, we, in the past, would conduct a uh, area wide scouting schools in two areas of the state and uh, bring in uh, consultants and, and their employees and a lot of agents would come to these as well. Uh, and uh, show them basically how to scout for insects and diseases in, in, uh, in our main row crops. Uh, this past year, because of COVID, uh, the training was conducted via a webinar. And uh, we actually had individuals from 13 states uh, log in and, and participate in the, uh, in the scout training in uh, actually two countries. So uh, we had a, a bigger impact than we thought and uh, actually saw quite a few people uh, log in on these things. There were 136 IPM meetings reaching over 6,000 clientele. And we have made a total of 218 uh, posts on IPM on a row crops blog with uh, quite a few hits there, as you can see. And then of course, uh, agents put out newsletters, 148 newsletters over the, the past three years, reaching a, a large number of, of uh, people. What are these impacts? And this, uh, we put together some impacts just for a couple of the, the programs. Uh, you know, I talked about the Southwestern Corn Borer Monitoring Program. Uh, those growers that don't have to spray, it costs about $29 an acre for the, the products that they use uh, uh, to spray that uh, corn for Southwestern Corn Borer to prevent it. So uh, those that didn't have to spray save that much, which actually, uh, because it was just a smaller, we have, this past year, about 70,000 acres of conventional corn in the state, but only about 5,000 acres uh, reached threshold. So uh, uh, the, the rest of the acreage would have been sprayed without this program for the most part as it was a prophylactic. So over $5 million in total savings over this uh, last three year period, uh, which also reduces the, has, we see a reduction of uh, around 6,500 pounds of insecticide active ingredient. Uh, as well that was not sprayed because because of the uh, monitoring. 
really another one of our, our, our key impacts has been the pest scouting schools as I, that I just talked about. Uh, just visiting and, and polling some of the attendees, they indicated they felt that the, by being trained that they reduced uh, the number of applications by at least one per acre that, that, they, that they scouted uh, because they had a, a better knowledge of what, uh, what they were looking for. And if you look at what basically an average insecticide application costs around $16 an acre now, depending on the crop, uh, but if we reduced uh, by reducing, if we reduce the application uh, on 25% of the row crop acres, uh, just on 25% would be a, an annual savings of $16 million uh, just in the state of Arkansas, uh, because we have over 4 million acres worth of uh, row crops in the state. So the row crop IPM program, we feel that the, you know, the benefits that uh, it, it does deliver IPM down at the county level uh, where the boots are on the ground with those county agents, uh, ability to focus on those priority areas. And, uh, and we do get some data from that with these surveys kind of gives us an idea of what's, what's going on in the field and uh, where things are at. And that also encourages those agents, particularly young ones to get in, in the field and get involved with their clientele and gives also them experience in, in writing grants because we, we do require them to write a budget and everything to uh, submit these mini proposals. And of course it does come with some drawbacks. This is time consuming reviewing those proposals, uh, accountability, making sure that they're doing their job. To, uh, so what we require is a report from the agents. If they don't get, if they don't report for that year, they, they we tell them there's no sense applying next year. They're not gonna get funded. Uh, we have a lot of support from the administration as far as making sure we, we, we don't have very many that don't actually submit a report. They all, all do a pretty good job. Uh, some of our other areas, briefly, uh, the IPM program with animal IPM with Kelly Lofton, as I said, our extension entomologist that, that really works in that and heads that up, uh, does a lot of forage IPM demonstrations. Uh, particularly with Bermuda grass stem mag. This is one that uh, some of the, the uh, forage producers didn't realize they had as a bigger problem as they did. And uh, by scouting and actually making some applications, I've seen some, some increases in hay production. Also fall armyworm and, and fire ants are some other demos that are in the forage IPM. Uh, it's not as many counties with this one, but uh, we do have 15 counties. Uh, also the live stock IPM, uh, some tick surveys were, were done this last uh, year or so, uh, looking for the Asian longhorn tick just to make sure it's not in the state. So far, no positives have been found, but uh, it says it's been beneficial to, to be able to monitor for these things. Specialty crops, you know, I did, you know, introduce the, the Aaron Cato was our extension horticulture IPM specialist. Uh, just like I said, he just started, but uh, it's conducted over 50 workshops uh, this last three years. Another benefit, some of the growers, uh, some of the agents work uh, with home garden demonstrations in every county, uh, usually with a specific uh, crop. Uh, this, this past year, it's been tomatoes. Uh, some of them do strawberries, but kind of helps a lot with showing uh, just home gardeners uh, the benefits of, of how to uh, control uh, diseases and insects in their, in their home gardens. Uh, we also have some areas that do some pretty good peak, uh, pecan IPM demonstrations uh, with some of the smaller growers in the state, which is also showing them how to scout for insects and manage for diseases. And there is a uh, Arkansas fruit, vegetable, and nut blog where a lot of this information is shared by Aaron uh, uh, to the uh, clientele. Uh, our IPM for pollinator protection, John Zvislak, has done an excellent job with this. Um, He's actually uh, working on his PhD as well and is about to finish up, but he uh, conducted 11 three-day short courses on pollinator health and IPM. Uh, when you add all those up, it was over 800 people attended those. So he does a great job with that. Probably one of the uh, big aspects of his program is he developed a pocket guide on honeybee health. Uh, it's a 30-page pocket guide. Many of the people that attended the classes and the beekeepers that he worked with uh, requested something like this, and he's done an excellent job with that. Also, this is being posted on uh, information on, on his, he does a great job with an extension beekeeping webpage and has a, a section on that on hive pests as well. Uh, but here's the, the, the webpage, and as you can see, the, the uh, honeybee uh, health guide there is, uh, they can download it as a printed version, but he also has a mo mobile friendly version if they wanna have it on their phone uh, again. 
uh, we've printed a lot of these and uh, have run out twice and uh, printing some more. So these are very, very popular and, and uh, a lot of positive comments from clientele on this particular uh, publication that he's developed. And then finally, our plant di uh, disease diagnostic lab. Again, uh, Sherry Smith is the director of this. Uh, we do provide partial support from the IPM program for a technician, uh, but uh, she, uh, they've, they've processed well over 5,000 samples. And uh, she puts out about 29 newsletters each year and an annual, annual report as well. And one of the things that, uh, not, not this last year because of COVID, but in the past uh, mobile lab that she sets up at flower and garden shows, it's been very beneficial where people can come and bring in samples uh, at that mobile lab and uh, they will diagnose them and visit with them and, and educate people at that. And also uh, has educated a lot of people through the Master Gardener program, giving uh, uh, them instruction on how to use the lab and also uh, uh, just information on on diseases in, in, uh, in the Master Gardener program as well. And this is the Plant Health Clinic. Uh, because of COVID, she has a, now a, a, the ability for people to submit plant samples online, basically with through uh, you know, high, high resolution pictures, if they can take it and give some instruction on that uh, to try to uh, uh, diagnose uh, those problems. Okay, uh, just want to acknowledge that, you know, the, the funding that we did receive from this is the, from the USDA NEFA uh, for the uh, CPPM program. Uh, and this is an extension implementation program. Uh, I want to thank them for their support and it really helps us with our IPM program here in the state uh, uh, very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any now. Thank you so much, Glenn. I love hearing about um, all the different things the different states are doing and uh, it sounds like you're doing some really interesting work in Arkansas. So thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. And just as a reminder, if you do have a question, you can put that in the Q&A box um, and you'll find that right at the bottom of your Zoom panel. And actually, Glenn, as I was listening, um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm always curious nowadays with COVID, if you've seen, um, you know, different kinds of extension efforts than you've seen in the past. Um, or, you know, different initiatives that you've had to push for? Well, I mean, one of the big changes is kind of like what we're doing here today. <laughs> a lot of our meetings uh, went virtual this year. Like I said, our scouting schools, we would conducted uh, uh, in the past, we would just conduct two of those and cover all the crops at each one. Uh, this year, because of COVID or this past year, we, we did basically one webinar for each crop. So I had five of them. I hid those up. And we had a lot more attendance than we thought. I had a lot of positive comments from people. And uh, we've recorded those and we're supposed to be getting them up on our website. But a lot of the uh, consultants and some other people uh, like that idea because they, they like to go back and be able to refresh their, their, their uh, information without having to actually attend a class, but just to go back and, and, and watch those again or even have their people watch it again. So we've seen a lot of that. And, and even with our production meetings uh, with COVID, we've, we've done a lot of, of this uh, webinars. I don't think it, uh, and we had a discussion uh, last week about that. We don't think it really, you know, it's not gonna take the place of in the future, even when COVID goes away, we need to get back to those uh, in-person meetings. But I think what we're gonna see is kind of a hybrid setup. Now we're gonna actually probably record as well as do in-person because uh, we found out there's some people that don't want to come to a meeting, but they will attend a, a, an online thing. And uh, so we think we're going to reach a, maybe a bigger audience in the future because of this. It's, it's something we've talked about for years doing, and now it's forced us to do it, <laughs> which is a good thing in a way, I guess. Uh, some of us older guys, we kind of were hesitant to, to, to jump in on it, but uh, it's not as, wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be. Well, I think, I think you really hit the nail on the head. It's going to be so interesting to see after all of this is over, you know, what, what is it going to be like then? Um, and I think you're right. It's going to be some sort of hybrid. So it'll be really interesting to see. 